Good morning and welcome to the King Institute for Faith and Culture. Uh, welcome to those online as well as here in person. My name is Martin Dotterweik and I direct the King Institute and it is a distinct pleasure to have you all here on a Friday morning, which I know is unusual for us. We usually run on Mondays. Um, it is a particular pleasure to have with us uh, this morning Malcolm Geit. I want to give you a couple of announcements before I introduce Malcolm. Uh, briefly, if you want to have some time to sit down and chat, we are going to move to the Tadlock house after this, and in Tadlock we'll have the Keurig going, and if you want to come and sit and have a chat for a bit, please do. Um, we also have books for sale uh, at the back of the room. This is one of four titles I think we have left. We sold quite a few last night, so if you listen to the poems and you think I want to get some of these for myself, they're there waiting for you at the back. Um, I'd also say that we have one more event coming up uh, for those of you in need of chapel credit, which is many of you here today. Uh, we do have one more event, and our speaker happens to be with us this morning, Jeff Monroe. Jeff, would you stand briefly or wave at us? Is going to be our speaker on Monday for the Frederick Beekner Lecture. Uh, this is an annual event we've held for many years in honor of uh, a writer who has been important for King in many respects. Sunday afternoon, we're going to talk about the 40th anniversary of his memoir, The Sacred Journey, in the Tadlock House, and on, on Monday at 9.15 here in the chapel and at 7 o'clock at Central Presbyterian, Jeff is going to lead us through some reflections on Fred's life and legacy. Malcolm Geit comes to us from uh, retirement, sort of, in Norfolk. Uh, we have attempted to make this happen, and this is the fourth date that we settled on, but it's worth the wait, and I think you'll agree with me this morning uh, that that wait has been uh, uh, very much worth the time. He has been many things after an undergraduate uh, study at Cambridge University. He was a secondary school teacher, did a PhD at the University of Durham, has been ordained in the Church of England and served as a parish priest, and then went back to Cambridge again, where he has served for many years as the chaplain of Girton College, Cambridge, also teaching in theology and literature. He's the author of a number of books of poetry. He is, uh, has a number of CDs of his songs, um, and we are delighted to have him here with us today. Please welcome with me Malcolm Geit. Well, thank, thank you very much for that warm introduction. Uh, it's been wonderful to be here. I'm glad at last that we've made it. You know, I, all kinds of things intervened in COVID and then I set up sequences of events and other people changed when I was coming. It all got, I'm, it's rather like um, one of my great literary heroes is G.K. Chesterton. And when he began to travel and speak, he, uh, he got very mixed up. And there's a famous occasion when he sent his wife a telegram which simply said, I'm in Market Harbour, where should I be? <laughs> well, I am in Bristol where I should be, and I'm delighted to be here. I've called this an unexpected music, poetry and renewal, and I want simply to enjoy uh, some, some, some poetry with you. Um, now, I know it's great to see some of you coming into chapel all there at the back, and I know you get your chapel credits, and I just, in case anybody is thinking, oh no, poetry. Oh, what's po um, I just want to, you know, to say this is going, I hope to be fun, there's no right or wrong answers, nobody gets asked anything afterwards. I totally understand how sometimes, even with the best wishes uh, and the best intentions, sometimes some teachers, maybe more in high school than anywhere, like here, can kind of put you off poetry because they make you think you're not good enough for it or they make you think that your first tentative answer, the thing you hoped, might be the glimmering of a response when the poem the teacher read moved you. And you start just gently to say it and she totally crushes it, you know, and says, no, that's wrong. Um, so uh, the poet Billy Collins has that uh, nice poem, the Texas poet, where he says that, uh, his teacher's idea of what to do with a poem was to, to, to tie it to a chair and beat it with a hosepipe till it confessed what it meant. Uh, and he says, but I wanted to put my ear up to the murmuring hive of the poem and wonder what honey the innumerable bees of its words were making. 
Well, if um, we'll do it, we'll do as I did last night. We'll do a, a minor exorcism here, since I'm a priest. If the if the the unrested shade of that disapproving teacher who made you feel inadequate about poetry, if that grey shade is lingering somewhere on the fringes and edges of your memory, we'll just say, depart now, go to the place prepared for you, and never return. So, so we put that teacher in eternal detention, and now it's playtime. So it is playtime. I want you to enjoy. What I'm going to do, in fact, since I've said an unexpected music, poetry and renewal, I'm going to read you a poem about an unexpected music, about a music you never would have known to listen for. Uh, it's a poem called The Rain Stick by Seamus Heaney. You have it there. Martin's kindly uh, made this nice little booklet for it. Um, and it's one of my favorite poems. It's, it's the opening poem in a book called The Spirit Level that came out, I think, in about 96. And um, it begins with these very simple words, upend the rain stick. When I first read that poem, I didn't actually know what a rain stick was. I got something about what this poem was about. But it so happened I was in a church where there was a worship band, and shortly after I'd read this poem, somebody upended a rain stick. And I was going, oh, I get it. So um, I'm going to do exactly what it says on the tin. And somebody has kindly sourced me an actual rain stick. So I'm going to um, play the rain stick with for you as I read the poem, and I hope we'll be able to read the whole thing very playfully. So just to, a word about the rain stick. You can see this is a very unpromising thing, dry, desiccate, just a dry old stick. Um, it's, it's thorns, it's a cactus stalk, isn't it? And its thorns have been pushed inward to create the sort of um, resistance and scales and through which, as we will hear in the poem, the grit or dry seeds will fall. And if you didn't know it was a rain stick and you just saw it leaning up against a wall in someone's house, you'd think like, why have they got that? You know, couldn't they at least have had something with leaves and flowers? But then if you upended it, you would know. So here we go. Upend the rain stick. And what happens next is a music you never would have known to listen for. In a cactus stalk, downpour, sluice rush, spillage and backwash come flowing through. You stand there like a pipe being played by water. You shake it again lightly and diminuendo runs through all its scales like a, like a gutter stopping, trickling. Now, here comes a sprinkle of drops out of the freshened leaves, then subtle little wets off grass and daisies, then glitter drizzle, almost breaths of air. Upend the stick again. What happens next is undiminished for having happened once, twice. Ten, a thousand times before. Who cares if all the music that transpires is the fall of grit or dry seeds through a cactus? You are like a rich man entering heaven through the ear of a raindrop. Listen, now, again. He says again, so I'll do it again. <laughs> So, isn't, um, isn't that an astonishing poem? I mean, in a way, it's so simple. It doesn't require a lot. It's not bristling with footnotes. It's not recherche. It gives you something straight away. But I can tell you that it keeps on giving. It contains the lines, what happens next is undiminished for having happened once, twice, ten, a thousand times before. And I can tell you that I've been upending the rain stick of this poem into myself and into others many, many times. And each time I hear something a little more, something more comes from it. What happens next is undiminished. Indeed, the rain stick and what Heaney says about it is very like poetry itself and how poetry works. 
Who cares if all the music that transpires is the fall of grit or dry seeds through a cactus? You are like a rich man entering heaven. It's astonishing. Just as we upend this, and the grit and dry seeds are not water, they're not rain, they're not the sprinkle of drops off the freshened leaves, they're not the subtle little wet soft grass and daisies or the downpour of the sluice rush. They're grit and dry seeds. But then the words... Downpour, sluice rush, spillage. Those aren't the things they are. The sprinkle of drops out of the freshened leaves, the subtle little wet soft grass and daisy. Those are their counters, their, their, their symbols, their sounds, their tokens that we exchange in the reading of the poem. And yet, what you get is the music of water. What you get is the refreshment. Something is transformed and transfigured. And maybe the poem itself, maybe every poem, is a kind of rain stick. The great thing, have you noticed about this rain stick, is in the very act of playing it, you're, you're charging it up again. The very act of releasing the unexpected music is storing up more music for the next time you upend it. Now that is very true of poetry. It's almost the mark of good poetry that the very act of having upended and poured and allowed to fall through all the resonant music-making shelves and levels of your mind against which the words will fall and strike their music. Every time you do that with a great poem, you understand and hear its music a little more. And next time, it's not only undiminished, it's even richer. But um, that's the search, by the way. I think there's a thing going on here about poetry itself with the rain stick. But uh, let's just think for a moment about how the poem strikes us. Um, I have to say, the first time, the first time I, I, I read this poem, I felt compelled to read it out loud. I really loved the sheer sound of it. And what I first got from this poem, simply, was this combination of the imagery of water and the musical sounds of its falling. So what happens next is a music you never would have known to listen for in a cactus stalk. Downpour, sluice, rush, spillage, and backwash come flowing. Do you hear that sound? Sluice, wash, spillage, backwash, all that. And then it's like it clears, come flowing through. I imagine the huge downpour on a roof somewhere. I imagine it running down and into the gutter, like a gutter stopping trickling. But it, I imagine it running down the side pipe until it almost backs up, and then a little clearage going, and then it comes flowing through. And then I got the sense of uh, all the different varieties of rain. In fact, he mentions the word diminuendo. And I don't know if you notice, just as with the rain stick, you start with this big and then it gradually goes down to the trickle. Look at this, it's almost cinematic the way he starts with the big downpour, sluice rush. Then you get this diminuendo, you get the little water coming out of the bottom of the gutter, then you have the sprinkle of drops out of the freshened leaves. You know what that's like when it's been raining and it's sort of stopped raining and you go out and then you're walking under a tree and there's just a little bit of a breeze and you get that unexpected refreshing. It's not just the leaves that are freshened, is it? It's you. Um, and then we go down stiller, then we get the subtle little wets off grass and daisies. And then that beautiful glitter drizzle, almost breaths of air. You know how it is when it's been raining and it's, it's stopped, the sun's come out, but there's still a lot of moisture in the air. And you get that kind of slightly glittery effect. And then finally, we get down to the tiny drop, the ear of the raindrop reflecting everything. So it's beautiful, beautiful account of the refreshing sounds of water, of rain in all its different forms. And obviously you think, well, well, well done, Seamus, that's good. I'm glad to have a, a nice poem about rain. And um, obviously if you're an Irish poet and you can't do rain, you're in trouble because, you know, that's mainly what you have to write about. It's why it's, uh, uh, it's a green land. Um, but of course, I wasn't getting the half of it. It was only when I came back to the poem, when, as it were, I appended the rain stick again, that I realized that there was a whole counterpoint to all of that. In fact, even as I was realizing it was a counterpoint to all the refreshment, 
I realize there's a lot of musical language in this poem as well. I mean, it, it has the word music and listen in the first verse, and then it has a pipe being played by water. Then it has diminuendo, a musical term, and it has that beautiful play on the word scales. Diminuendo runs through all its scales. There's the scaliness of this. But anybody who's learned an instrument knows you have to play your scales, don't you? You have to run through your scales in order to learn to play. Uh, and then it's got the, the pipe being played by water, and it's got the breaths of air, almost like a breathy flute. So I, I read it again and thought, oh, this beautiful music all the way through this poem. It's not just water, it's water as music, music as water. And then, of course, I saw, to borrow a musical term, the counterpoint. That as long as, as just as much as there is the rain, two words in the title, rain stick. <laughs> I first only heard the music of the rain in this poem. Then I suddenly realized that set against that, are these other different, dry, desiccate, rebarbative words? Stick, cactus, stalk, scale, grit, dry. All those words from a completely different register are in there. And so then, when I held those two things together, as they are there in the very title, rain, stick, I began to get a little bit more of what this is about. This isn't just about refreshment or the beautiful refreshing sounds of rain. This is about the unexpected music. A music you never would have known to listen for in a cactus stalk downpour, sluice rush, spillage and backwash come flowing through. And if in that refreshment, in that sprinkle of drops out of the freshness leaves, there's something beautiful, something graceful, there is grace itself. If it turns out at the end of the poem that this is no mere bit of refreshing on a hot day, but actually is the sweet water of spiritual refreshment, is maybe even leading to the gate of heaven itself and an invitation to enter heaven. Then if this, is the, if this water is the water of a suddenly springing and refreshing grace, then this poem is not about grace in the ordinary course of things, grace when you're already feeling pretty okay about yourself. This poem is about grace at the zero point. It's about refreshment, yes, but refreshment from the dry. If it's about a sudden spring of water, it's not a spring of water in a valley that's already refreshed by many streams. It's about a spring of water in the desert. If it were to have its biblical resonances, which I believe in a very subtle and understated way, it does, then in the Old Testament, it's perhaps about that moment when the children of Israel have fled out of Egypt, but they have their long journey in the wilderness, and they're in the desert, and they're starving, and they're thirsty, and they're murmuring, and they're longing to maybe even go back into slavery, because at least you got a hot meal, you know, they're longing, as the old translation said, for the flesh pots of Egypt. And then wouldn't you know it, in the middle of everything else, right as the, everything else is going badly, they're walking along their way, and there's a great big ruddy rock in the way. And I don't know, there's different versions, isn't there, of what happens next, how and why Moses strikes the rock. But I can certainly imagine him striking it in sheer frustration, like, this is all I need. He strikes the rock, the very impediment, that dry, difficult, repellent thing that is the impediment in their path. He strikes that rock, and from that rock flows the sweet, refreshing stream and the living waters. That's maybe an Old Testament version of what might be happening in this, a music you never would have known to listen for, the downpour sluice rush from the cactus stalk. If there is a New Testament, um, if there's a New Testament uh, image or pattern that might be lying gently behind this poem, and I think this is even closer to the poem itself, then surely it is the story of the woman at the well, uh, whom Jesus meets, the Samaritan woman by Jacob's well. You remember how deeply unpromising that scenario is. You know, the disciples have gone off into the village to buy food. Jesus is completely exhausted. We're told in no uncertain terms in John's Gospel that it is the noon, it is the heat of the day. You know, nobody in their right mind would be even out 
we guess later that this woman is at the well then because she can't go with her community because she's, she's been edged out by them. And you remember, Jesus says, give me a drink. And all the woman can see is the difficulties. Like, this is definitely not going to work. There's a problem here, you know, you're, 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 a, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan, you know, you're a man, I'm a woman, this isn't going to work. The well's too deep, we haven't got the right kind of buckets, you know. And then he just changes everything and says, if only you knew who is asking you. You would ask him and he would give you what? A fountain welling up within you. There's an unexpected music of water. So maybe that's there. So I began to realize that it was both about refreshment and about the dry, and that it was about the unexpected release of the music of grace and refreshment from the dry and the desiccate and the unpromising. There was one more thing I think I needed to get. I'm a very, very little brain. I had to upend the rain stick poem through myself quite a few times to finally see this, because eventually you have to ask, how does that happen? How does this unexpected thing happen when time after time we've walked past the rain stick and it's just another dry old cactus stalk? Time after time we've been in the desert and the rock has just been another impediment. It hasn't even occurred to us to strike it. Time after time we've given up before there's even a promise of a well springing up within us. We just say this is too unpromising. I can't deal with it. I'll take some kind of diversion. What is it? that allows the unexpected music to be released. And of course the answer, staring me in the face, is there in the very opening word of the entire poem. Upend the rain stick. And what happens next is a music that you never would have known to listen for in a cactus storm. Don't upend it and you'll never know. Leave everything just the way you found it, you know, as per usual, right way up. You miss the release of that music and grace. What we're going to do is give it a shake and turn it upside down. That's interesting. The poem addresses us personally. It addresses us in the imperative voice. It's telling us to do something right now in the present. Upend the rain stick. And that set me thinking. I thought, well, that's very interesting. Upend, turn upside down. And then I began to see that there is a whole series of upendings going on in this poem. There is immediately, once we've upended the rain stick, there is the upending of our expectations. We don't expect water from the dry and the desiccate, but that's what we get. The music of the downpour, the sluice rush, the spillage, the backwash. But very early on in this poem, there's another upending, which I think is highly significant, which you might miss, but um, is there. And in order to, to share that with you, I think I need to say, um, I'll go briefly. Having, having mocked the poor English teacher who taught poetry badly, I'm going to go back into my own English teacher mode now. Did you guys ever have to do um, sort of parsing sentences? where you figure out how a sentence works. And do you remember that, like a sentence has subject, verb, object? Do you remember that? Does that ring any bells? So the subject is doing, is, is the person or the thing that's going to do the action, the verb is the doing action, and the object is the one, you know, that's done unto. Um, to take an impossible sentence that would never actually happen just to illustrate it, Malcolm cut his hair. So, so Malcolm would be the subject there, cut would be the verb and his hair would be the object okay so we all had that we had that drilled into us right subject verb object but actually that was only the tip of a very cold analytical iceberg that's been floating around wrecking our culture for a while because there was this much deeper division between the subjective so-called and the objective so-called I remember when I came rather late into the English school system and I had my first chemistry lesson, which was, you know, fascinating. And I was really behind in the subject. I'd never done proper science. All the kids had been doing chemistry and biology and physics as separate subjects for like three years. So this was my first ever time in the chem chemistry lab at school. And it was great. We were doing acid and alkali and we were using litmus, litmus paper to check the, the, what, whether it was an acid or alkali solution. And the, the, the cool thing is the litmus paper actually changes color. So I'd never seen that. And, you know, we were told to do the exact 
measurements and this is when you do it and write up the experiment. And I got all the numbers and quantities, the quantities, exactly right. But for me, the overwhelming thing was the quality of the experience. Fantastic. So we were all supposed to write it up for homework, or write up our experiment. And I wrote, I have to say, you know, for, a, for an ardent 14-year-old, a considerable, um, rather, rather, rather gushy prose poem about it. And I said, you know, I came into the chemistry lab. I was amazed. It was beautiful to be able to be allowed to, to light the Bunsen burners. And then I was saying, you know, I put the measurement of the alkali solution in the test tube. Gently, I dipped the thing in. The colors changed. Man, you had to be there. It was astonishing. You know, when, you know I wrote the whole thing up. I was quite pleased with it. Handed it in. And... Um, uh, I thought he's going to like this and then the, in those days, you know, teachers spent half their time ritually humiliating students and uh, um, so, but I didn't know that, you know, I was new to the English system. <laughs> so he says, I'm giving back your prep, your homework and he calls me up, he says, Geit, come up here and he's got my, my exercise book. I thought, oh, he's singling me out for praise and then he opens the book and my homework my write-up of the experiment is covered in red ink. And there's a series of like red slashes in it, like some gaping wounds. And the most frequently crossed out, in fact, every single example is crossed out, is the first person singular. I put this in the test tube. I um, in, uh, immersed the litmus paper. I saw this happen. And he said, Geit, I don't want this subjective drivel. I want the objective truth. We never, under any circumstances, bring ourselves into this experiment. We never use the active voice in the first person. We always use the passive voice. I said, sorry, sorry, I don't understand. He said, you don't say I put the litmus paper in the chemistry solution. You say the litmus paper was exposed to the solution. It was observed that. I said, you mean I'm supposed to write about this experiment as if there was nobody there to do it? There was nobody in the room, so he said, absolutely right. That's objective truth. I thought, really? <laughs> we just all pretend we weren't there. <laughs> it was, but I began to realize that's what's happened to our culture, that so-called objective stuff, all the facts and, 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 and quantities, that's out there in the proper objective world. But anything we saw or felt, anything that makes life worth living, any inner, inner blossoming of awareness, any consciousness that did the experiment, oh, we can't account for that, that's just private. That's subjective. There's a kind of weird, you know that epistemology is, epistemia is the Greek word for know, so epistem to know something. And um, epistemology is a whole science and philosophy of what we know, right? I think we have an epistemological apartheid going on here. We have separate development. We have the main economy where all the, all the, you know, the, the stuff that has meaning and kudos in society is the so-called objective, but it's got no values, no truths, no love, no right, no wrong, just the chemistry. <laughs> and over here in this little Bantu stand, of separate development. We can have our private things and our religion can be tucked in there somewhere, but it's not supposed to be out here. I don't like that and I don't buy it. And I find when I talk to the physicists at Cambridge who are doing the quantum experiments, they don't buy it either. <laughs> they think that who we are and how we ask the question radically changes the nature of the stuff we're looking at. But we were brought up with that division. Well, look at the upending of the rain stick that is happening right here in this poem. Okay, upend the rain stick. Upend is the verb, right? The doer of the verb is you, right? You're supposed to upend the rain stick. You upend the rain stick. So that's it, you know, subject, verb, upend, rain stick, object. I am playing the rain stick, right? But then let's just look down to the fourth line. You stand there like a pipe being played by water. Ah, you thought you were playing the rain stick, but actually the rain stick is playing you. The, this is the grit and the dry seeds, but the real thing that's happening, the downpour, sluice rush, pillage, the beautiful music of refreshment, all those links you can make in your mind, that's, you're the instrument. In a sense, 
The words of the poem are the grit and the dry seeds, and you're the rain stick. You stand there like a pipe being played by water. Isn't that a lovely idea? The water of this poem, the refreshment, is running through you like a pipe, and it's making a particular music. You stand there like a pipe being played by water. Now, when I teach this poem sometimes to students in Cambridge who've been brought up in a highly secular, highly, if you like, they've been born into and only ever live with that subject-object split. And I say subject and object have been completely upended and reversed here. And what you thought was the object is the subject and the other way around, they get very upset. They feel like I've done something really disruptive, which I have. Interestingly, when I read this to Christian students, or almost anybody who's had some experience, as it were, of the spiritual realm, what it does is ring bells. I thought I was playing the rain stick, now it's playing me. Oh, wait a minute, I've had that experience. I open my Bible. I, subject, verb, read, Bible. Subject, verb, object. The Bible is the object out there, I'm doing the verb. Except about five lines in to reading that astonishing book, I find the book is reading me. And it's doing more than read, it's reading me rather more closely than I would like to be read. <laughs> it's never missing a page. In fact, it's become completely active rather than passive now. It's reaching out to me like a sharp two-edged sword. It's piercing to the division of joint and marrow. Oh, this is getting a bit uncomfortable, so I, uh, I'll close the book. And since I've been a bit disturbed by that, I'll say a prayer. Now I'm back in the good old subject, verb, object thing. So I, subject, pray, verb, to God. Object. Very, very distant object. But I'll shoot up an arrow prayer. Or maybe if I sing this chorus for the 15th time, you know, he'll finally hear. But, so I pray to God. Subject, verb, object. Except I've been so disturbed by the way the book I was trying to read started reading me, that I get to a point where I don't know what to pray anymore. And I'm sort of stuck. And then suddenly, I stand there like a pipe being played by water. Or shall I say like a pipe being prayed by the water of the Spirit. When you do not know what to pray, the Spirit prays within you with groanings too deep to be uttered. But wait a minute, I thought God was the object out there and I was supposed to be praying. But the, the Spirit, the Lord of the Spirit is God. Three persons, one God. We can, we, can, um, we can distinguish the persons, but we must not confound the substance. They are one. God is inside me at this moment, lifting my prayers through in the Spirit through Christ to the Father who then pours down his love on me in the Spirit. And I'm caught up into this cycle. I stand there like a pipe being played by water. Now this is exactly what Jesus did for the woman at the well. Give me a drink, he says. She says, these are all the problems, we can't do it. And then he says, if only you knew who is asking you, here's the first upending and reversal, you would ask him <laughs> and he would give you a fountain welling up within you to eternal life. Suddenly, that reversal has happened. The old split is gone. This woman is going, oh my goodness, I'm on the verge of a spiritual experience. What can I do to stop it? I'll talk about religion. That'll kill it stone dead. So she immediately tries to waylay Jesus with this, like your ancestors worshipped on this mountain and we worship on that mountain, and which is the right mountain? You know, like, let's just talk about something out there in the objective world. I can't bear this thing. And he says, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's not so easy. Neither, neither. I'm not, I'm not even buying that dichotomy. The time is coming and will come when the, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And then all kinds of truths about her and her life start coming up. And then you get the final app ending. You know that she's only there at noonday because, you know, you've had five husbands and the one you're having now is not your husband and all that. There are issues. And uh, notice, by the way, she gets the full complete officer, offer of the, of the fountain welling up. When Jesus already knows all that stuff, it makes no difference. She doesn't even have to repent of it yet. The rising fountain inside her will take care of that later. That'll wash things clean. But she gets the gift straight away. And by the time she's gone back to her village and said, come and see a man who told me everything about myself, could he be the Messiah? 
The whole village is converted. This woman from right the very edge, all things are upended. She becomes the one who renews her whole community. What happens next is a music you never would have known to listen for in a Samaritan woman. <laughs> but it came by upending everything. And then I thought, well, wow, that upending, what does upending really mean? What was the first thing that Jesus says in the Gospel of Mark? Repent and believe the kingdom, you know, metanoia, new mind. What does his teaching do? He turns everything upside down, look at the Beatitudes. In the end, he takes the worst possible thing, the most unpromising, an act of utter hatred and torture as we drive the nails into his hands. And he says, okay, I'm going to upend this now. <laughs> And I'm going to make your act of hatred the very opening of the wellspring and source of my love as my blood flows into the world for your forgiveness. No wonder in the Acts of the Apostles we're told that these Christians are people who turned the world upside down. But in upending that, they release this astonishing music of grace. Well, I've, I've linked out to a few kind of gospel moments that I think are implicit in this poem. But notice that he doesn't use any of them. He doesn't use any of the jargon of religion. He doesn't use any of the language of Zion. And that's what poetry does, is it takes something that you thought you knew, but which, with which you were over-familiar, and it bodies it forth in completely new language and shows it to you again. And that certainly happened for me as a Christian who was maybe getting a bit dried up and desiccate in his faith. Unexpectedly, this poem uh, by uh, an Irish poet about an Aboriginal, you know, world music instrument suddenly releases for me a fresh understanding of what grace is and what it is to have the world turned upside down. But having said that, I have to say there is one slightly more direct, slightly less oblique, maybe even quasi-explicit gospel reference that comes right at the end of this poem. You guys probably got there before me. You might have puzzled, since I told you the poem was written in the mid-90s, why he uses that rather archaic and, from a modern perspective, less inclusive language about the rich man. You are like a rich man entering heaven through the ear of a raindrop. Surely he could have had something more inclusive and less gender specific. But then you think, wait a minute, I've heard that phrase. What is this rich man entering heaven thing? That sort of rings a bell. And uh, then finally, you know, you get it. And you go, oh, I remember. It's that strange puzzle when Jesus says how hard it is for a rich man to enter heaven. I tell you, it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven. And you remember the disciples respond, who then can be saved? Which is a really dumb question, because the obvious answer is the poor. <laughs> who then can be saved? It is impossible, they say. And then Jesus says this wonderful thing. He says, all things are possible with God. All things. Maybe even, then he offers them this possible impossibility of the camel getting through the eye of the needle. Now, there's loads of different interpretations of that. Some uh, commentators say it's a typical example of what they call Semitic exaggeration. So like when, when Jesus says, first take the log out of your own eye before you take the speck out of your brother's. But some people think it may be a more specific re reference that of the 12 gates of Jerusalem, the narrowest and smallest one was called the eye of the needle. And the thing about that is if you were poor and just on foot, you could walk right through. Even if you could get as much as like having a donkey, you could walk through with it. But if you had a camel, you couldn't just ride your camel through if it was fully laden. You could, however, get the camel through the eye of the needle. But what you had to do is get the camel to kneel down outside the gate. You had to take everything off the camel, all unload it totally, put that down, unburden the camel, and then they had to get your camel drivers pushing and pulling and, you know, swearing and cursing, and that's the camel and the drivers, you know. And you could get this thing literally on its knees through the gate. Then once it was through, it could stand up. Then you had to walk back and sort of schlep all the luggage through. And, you know, apparently it was a sort of legitimate diversion of the poor to sit on a bench and watch the rich sweat for a while while they're getting their camel through. 
Anyway, whichever it is, this possible impossibility, it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven. Heaney glances gently over and says, well, if you can have the eye of a needle, sure I'll have the ear of a raindrop. You are like a rich man entering heaven in spite of everything through the ear of a raindrop. How would that happen? Boy, well, both for the camel and for you in the ear, there's talk about diminuendo runs through all its scales of doing. How do you, if you were to look, if you were to follow Heaney's diminuendo down from the big downpour down to the last tiny drop and really look at the round reflective surface of that drop of rain, what would you see? You'd see everything. You'd see everything reflected and tiny in that curved surface, yourself. Shakespeare said that art and poetry holds up, as it were, a mirror to nature. But George Herbert went a bit further. George Herbert said, a man that looks on glass, on it may stay his eye, but if he pleaseth, through it pass, and then the heavens espy. Herbert also holds up something to pass through to heaven. And I think, in fact, I know Heaney knew that poem and indeed had it in mind. I had the joy once of spending a day with Heaney at Little Gidding, and he recited that very Herbert poem. So uh, how do we do that? Where is the diminuendo? How can we make ourselves so small that we pass through the drop to heaven? Or can heaven make itself so small? Well, of course, heaven has. That was the greatest upending of all, surely. Though he was found in form equal to God, he did not cling to equality God, with God, but emptied himself, upended, poured himself down, and took the form of a servant. And he was once as tiny as a dewdrop in the womb of Mary. And in him, we too can pass through all of that. I think all of that is gently there. Now, I've also given you on this handout uh, a couple of poems of my own just about transformation and about uh, renewal and about what I've called, well, there's a beautiful Greek word, pleroma, the rich, abundant, overflowing of, uh, of all that God does for us. Uh, perhaps I can't, I won't do the imagined one, but I might just read you good measure. This is my sense of that wellspring, actually, it's more than just the spring of living water, isn't it? The first miracle, the first sign in John is not that one, but the water into wine, and the wine is really his heart's blood shed for us. So maybe I'll just close with this poem of my own, Good Measure. I'm riffing on Luke 6:38. give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be put into your lap, for the measure you give will be the measure you get back. More than good measure, measure of all things, pleroma overflowing to our need, fullness of glory, all that glory brings, unguessed at blessing, springing from each seed. Even the things within the world you make give more than all they have, for they are more than all they are. Gifts given for the sake of love keep giving. Draw us to the core where love and giving come from, the rich source that wells within the fullness of the world, the reservoir, the never spent resource, poured out in wounded love until it spilled even from your body on the cross, the heart's blood of our maker shed for us. That's where the richest overflowing comes from. Thank you very much for patiently listening. I think I've come to the end of this. <laughs>